debate, reprise de débat, l'honorable député. The honourable member for Elmwood Transcona. Speaker, and I'm I'm pleased to advise you that I'll be splitting my time with the member for Squamalt uh, Sanic Sook this morning. And um, I just want to speak to what is a bit of a, a grab bag of various initiatives that we've largely seen before here in the House in other Conservative Opposition Day motions. So I take it that my colleagues on the Conservative side won't be surprised at the fact that the NDP doesn't intend to support this motion because we've actually debated and voted on most of these initiatives already in this House. In fact, one, one wonders if there isn't a procedural question about revisiting some of the same uh, decisions in, in the House. Um, but I will put that procedural point on hold to address what I take to be the substantive issues here uh, in the motion. And of course, it's talking about a very real problem that Canadians are experiencing and can't get away from, frankly, which is the uh, incredible uh, price increases at the grocery store, at the pump, and elsewhere on just about everything, it seems, sometimes. Um, that's making it really difficult for Canadians to be able to operate within their normal budget. We all know that wages are not keeping pace with the extent of price increases that we're seeing. So we certainly welcome an opportunity to talk about the impact that inflation is having on, on Canadians and to propose solutions even where we disagree about what those solutions ought to be. One of the solutions uh, proposed here is to simply lift all public health uh, restrictions and We've said many times here in this House that we, that we support public health officials leading those conversations, as they have in provinces where they've come to certain conclusions, and federal public health officials at the moment have come to different conclusions. What we support is for public health officials to make those decisions. We also believe that Canadians have a right to know the evidence and the information on which those are, those are based. And I do think that the government's refusal to table that evidence and to make it public has created a problem of public trust in our institutions that is growing and I would beseech the government to make that information public and to be very frank about the recommendations they're getting from public health and the, and the data and the evidence that supports that because that is important to build public trust and to maintain public trust in our institutions. It's something that we need now more than ever and it's something that the government I think is doing a disservice to uh, Canadians and to our institutions by not being more forthcoming with the information that they're receiving from public health officials. So even as we support public health officials, we certainly have our own critique of the government, how it's handled the file and what that has meant in terms of Canadians' own attitudes towards our public health officials at the federal level. And, and as I say, call upon the government to do, to do better in supporting those institutions and Canadians by being frank, open and accountable about the information that drives their decision making. But that's not the call here. The call here is to substitute politicians for public health officials and say that the House of Commons should decide rather than experts based on the best available evidence. And that's a wrong turn. It's not one that we've supported at any time during the pandemic and it's not one that we're gonna support at this time or any time in the future, even as we encourage the government to do a better job of making that information available. When we talk about housing, what I find and maybe I'll just speak more generally now for a moment about the, about the motion because it talks about a number of things. It talks about lowering the GST and the carbon tax on the price of gas, even though, um, even though that's a solution that actually doesn't touch as many people as it needs to because we know there are a lot of people that don't drive vehicles that are also suffering from, from inflation. There are people who ride their bike, who take public transportation, who can't afford to own a car. Um, and it does that by, uh, and it helps perpetuate a culture that's driving uh, climate change. So it's bereft of any kind of meaningful thinking, I think, about the next real economic crisis that has already started to make itself felt and is only going to continue to make itself felt to a greater and greater degree. So our solution to inflation in the present moment can't be one that is going to compound a growing economic problem which is the problem of climate change. We have to find solutions to inflation now that also set us up for success moving into the future as we are going to have to continue with, uh, to grapple with serious economic challenges that are going to cause economic displacement and are going to continue to cause upward cost pressure on, uh, on goods of all kinds as climate change continues to interfere 
with supply chains beyond the life of the uh, pandemic. When I said I wanted to speak a little more generally, what I meant was that what is characteristic of conservative solutions, as they call them, is that they're completely blind to the role that the private sector plays in driving inflation as well. It's as if the private sector is completely innocent, corporate, corporate board members are completely innocent, the CEOs of large companies like oil and gas companies, big box stores, insurance companies and banks that have all made a killing during the pandemic, profits way above their pre-pandemic norms, are somehow innocent, and if we only left it more to them, everything would work out. They don't talk about the kind of good work that's been done by the member of Windsor West on gas prices to actually do something, because I'll tell you what, I mean, they say, when we talk about raising taxes on oil and gas companies, they say, that'll just get passed on to the consumer. Then, in the next breath, they say, let's cut taxes on gas, as if those same companies that have been known to jack up the price of gas by eight cents a liter just because of a long weekend aren't gonna take that space up themselves now that they know people are prepared to pay for it. The blind spots are inexcusable. And the way actually to take meaningful action on gas prices to follow the lead of the member for Windsor West who's talked about establishing a price monitoring board that would look at real data from the, the oil and gas industry and determine what fair pricing might be. And then to have an ombudsperson that would actually be able to take complaints from Canadians who notice that the price of gas jumps every time somebody sneezes internationally and they're worried that it might cause a crisis. So they, well, actually they're not worried. They see it as an opportunity for speculation. That's what needs to be reined in. And the only way to do that is by properly regulating the market. And then when you do that, you can increase taxes on oil and gas companies that have made record profits over the course of the pandemic and know that that money can be reinvested back into Canadians without them having to pay for it at the pump. That's how you set up an infrastructure to actually look after Canadians and make sure that they're being treated fairly. And we don't hear that except from the NDP in this place. And, it's a, and I hope that we'll start to hear about it from, from more than New Democrats in this place because it's something that actually ought to get done. But the idea that somehow just by giving a little bit of a break at the pump for those who are, who are, who are driving vehicles is going to be the solution to inflation, I think it's facile and it puts us on the wrong track in terms of the much bigger economic problem that we're facing down that is climate change. We talk about housing, their solution for housing proposed here is to have a public inquiry into money laundering. Well, we should be looking into money laundering and the role that it's placing, that it's playing. But if we're talking about urgent action to help people during the pandemic, people would be much better off getting a bigger GST rebate, paid for by the largest companies that are making the biggest profits. And I named, I named those industries earlier, the oil and gas industry, insurance, banking, big box stores are another one that have seen giant increases in profits. That's something that would go directly to Canadians that are the most in need. It's something we can do now. It's something the government has already done during the course of the pandemic. And that's why we know it can be done. And we know it can be done quickly. And we know that it helps. Providing an extra $500 on the Canada Child Benefit this year is another way to help families that are struggling with rising costs. That's something that we can do right away. And we know that there are companies operating in Canada that have made additional profits that Canadians have paid for. So what's the difference between that and a tax? I ask you, Madam Speaker. When Canadians go to the grocery store and they need to buy food for their family and Loblaws or somebody else has decided to jack up the price in a moment of opportunity as they see it, to help, or whatever the rationale is to shield themselves from future risk, whatever it is, they've decided that Canadians are gonna pay more for things that they can't do without and that's gonna go into their bank account. The difference between that and a tax is that that never gets reinvested in Canadians at the bottom in the services that they need. And that's where a tax, if it's done well, is better, is better than what we too often hear from the Conservatives. So we have from them, and even I was, I'll say, because there's another issue, and I'm just looking to the chair to make sure I'm not gonna go over time. I know, I know members in the House would like for me to keep going, but I respect that. Oh, thank you very much. But I respect that there's some time. On the question of, of tariffs on fertilizer, I think there's an interesting point here. 
the conservatives clearly put together a list of things with people that they want to be able to talk to and please, and I'm happy to get to this in the Q&A if my time is truly done, Madam Speaker, but, but, but the fact of the matter is this reads more like a target demographic list of people they want to fundraise on. There are some important points about the tariff on fertilizer I'll get to in the question and the comments. Questions and comments, you want to remember Regina Luvin? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and it's happy to listen to the member opposite speech, but how far the NDP have truly fallen from being the party of hardworking Canadians. We talk about in this motion getting rid of restrictions and mandates so that people can go back to work. People in the public service, people that have been in the RCMP, people have been in the public service across this nation, over three to four million people haven't been able to go to work. Also, those same people can't travel within their own country. Yet all this member wants to talk about is big corporations and how they're bad for Canadians and how they never help Canadians. But what we want to do is talk about in this motion a few things, but one was getting Canadians back to work. So how far has the enemy fallen that they don't even care that people can provide for the families anymore? This member should be ashamed of that speech. The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, I'm certainly not ashamed to stand up and talk about the things you'll never hear from the Conservatives, which is the extent to which corporate Canada is also putting pain on Canadians. And we're also not embarrassed to be proposing real solutions about that. So, anyway, I, I will suppress the unparliamentary phrase that uh, comes to mind as an appropriate response to the member's question, and just say this, which is that people that want to go back to work also want to go back to work to safe workplaces. And for as much as there are people that are frustrated that they haven't been able to go to work because they didn't get the vaccine, there are also a lot of people that are glad to be in a safe workplace and glad to follow the directives of public health officials. And as I said, we believe government should do a better job of reinforcing faith in those public officials by being open and transparent about the information that they are getting from them. But a safe workplace is also about standing up for workers, and that's something we're proud to do on this side of the House. Questions and comments? Senator Parliament, Secretary of the Government, House Leader. Oh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Ma uh, Madam Speaker. My question to the member is, within the motion, they talk about uh, the tariffs on fertilizer, and that we, we all know that Russia is a major exporter of fertilizer. So it's not necessarily the, the post-contracts, but contracts that are moving forward uh, today. Um, does the member have any thoughts in regards to the, the issue? Uh, if you re read the motion, if you read the motion, um, does, does he believe that um, the federal government should, in fact, be uh, re uh, relieving uh, tariffs on fertilizer? So there's uh, other questions and comments coming in from the op official opposition. I would just ask them to please hold off uh, when it comes to questions and comments until I actually recognize them, and they've already had their opportunity to ask a question. So uh, the Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So the motion simply says eliminating tariffs on fertilizer, and, and the, the member for Winnipeg North is right to point out that tariffs were imposed on fertilizer coming from Russia as part of our effort to punish Vladimir Putin. I think the legitimate issue here is that there are farmers that sign contracts to buy fertilizer that are part of their pricing for the year before, before the invasion of Ukraine. And, and, there's a, and so there's a real question of fairness in terms of retroactively imposing a tariff on farmers that had already signed contracts to get that fertilizer, had built it into their pricing structure for the year. But we're not hearing that kind of conversation from the Conservatives. They're not trying to build a parliamentary consensus. They're trying to build a fundraising list. I think that comes across very clearly in the motion. Uh, I want to remind the members of the official opposition that it's not time for questions and comments unless I recognize them. And if they have other questions and comments, then they should stand up and attempt to be recognized. Otherwise, I would ask them to please hold on to their thoughts, jot them down, and wait for the appropriate time to be doing that. Questions uh, and comments? The Honourable Member for Santia Saint Bagot. Thank you for recognizing me, Madam Speaker, in a fully legitimate manner. Now, I'd like to ask my colleague, who I had the pleasure of sitting with on the Committee for International Trade. It, you know, it's really disrespectful what's happening in the House right now, and I would ask the Parliamentary Secretary as well not to partake into the discussions with the official opposition and going back and forth when somebody else has the floor. And so, again, I know that uh, most members that are uh, 
uh, participating in that right now have been in the House for some time and uh, should know what the rules of the House are. The Honourable Member for Santia Saint Bagot, a, a brief question, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is nice to be able to hear what I'm saying and not hear other voices drowning my own voice out. Now, my former colleague from the International Trade Committee, there was a, an idea put forward in 2021, a minimum tax rate between G7 countries to avoid having there be competition between tax systems, some of which might be better for multinationals so they could blackmail a country by saying, I'm going to move to another country if you don't give me lower tax rates. I thought that that idea was a good one, and it's a change from the neoliberalism we've been seeing for some decades. What does my colleague think? I'd like to thank my colleague for the question, which was offered in an appropriate fashion as well, for too long. We've been in a, in a type of contest, a race to the bottom, so to speak on this very issue. So the idea of having an agreement, a guarantee to have a minimum tax rate, a fair tax rate as a minimum, I think it's an excellent idea and I think it would be a great thing for companies that want to, say, want to stay in Canada but that are competing with businesses that are headquartered in countries with lower tax rates.